Okay, my 107 fans, we were talking about structure. Okay, so Bio 107 fans, we were talking in class and we had begun the conversation about differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and and I hope that just a quick review what you got out of that was that the main differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, right? So if I oh if I find a color here that would be good. Let's let's try white and let's make this be a little fatter than skinnier. So let's do this. So prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, right? So let's make a little list. Okay, prokaryotes are smaller. And they're basically 10 times smaller than eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have no organelles, and eukaryotes have membrane bound organelles. And what's the first thing you're going to say to me? You're going to say a membrane bound nucleus. All right? Nucleus. Prokaryotes mostly uh, replicate by binary fission. Where is right? We're all about sex. What else is uh, different? What other things do we say? How about what is the same? So what's the same in the middle category, right? Ribosomes are the same. You're going to do transcription and translation. That's both of those are going to happen. Uh, you have membranes are the same. Uh, prokaryotes, I have so there's flagella here, but there's flagella in eukaryotes. It's made with different proteins. So this one is called flagellin, and in pro uh, eukaryotes, sorry, fla. Flagella is made of microtubules. Just, just a basic understanding of the difference between these two uh, domains, do prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. You really need to have some of that down. All right. And what we were going to do is continue talking about cells and what do you know about cells. And really... Um, if I just put in another slide here and I say, okay, if we're talking about a prokaryotic cell and I asked you to draw it, right, here's a prokaryotic cell. What you just drew was that it had a plasma membrane. Some of them have a cell wall, right, so that's actually outside of the plasma membrane. What, so, cell wall, and that is not going to be unique to prokaryotes, right, because... Who else has a cell wall? Plants do. Okay, so let's just say the plasma membrane is the blue. I'm making a mess here. The cell wall is black. What else does it have? It has some DNA, and remember that DNA was inside the cell, and the DNA is called the nucleoid. And the only other things that we really said that were inside of a cell were some ribosomes. Ribosomes are not organelles. Um, there's always going to be uh, the cytoplasm. Sometimes there are cilia flagella, so cilia, flagella, it doesn't have to be one flagella, sometimes there's multiple flagella, um, sometimes there's something called a capsule, and that's even outside of, of this, I don't really know how to draw it, so it's kind of sticky material on the outside here, usually made of sugars, but if we're going to draw a eukaryotic cell, it's going to be completely different, right? It has all of these membrane-bound compartments as shown on this slide, 
And what you really get out of this concept is that the compartmentalization, right, compartments, has allowed for specialization and efficiency. So we're going to talk about all of these different organelles and what their functions are in 380. We do this in more detail and give you more of the actual molecular details of how these guys work. So just to start off with again, all right, all made up of membranes. It all starts out with membranes and you know what is in membranes now. You know that there's phospholipids and there's phospholipid heads and tails and these are always going to end up in a lipid bilayer, right? And so, right, if I were to do this crazy, what else is in membrane? You know that there's cholesterol, so right, you might have big chunks of cholesterol here and there in the membrane. Okay, we talked a little bit about there might be proteins that stick up and through the membrane on either side. You also could have proteins that are bound to either side and they could be bound either to another protein, this one's bound to that or to the lipids, or bound to this side. And so one interesting thing is that you have some proteins, okay, they're called, so the purple one in particular is called an integral protein, integral membrane protein, and it integral because it is in the membrane, actually in the membrane. The blue proteins are called peripheral membrane proteins, and they have no portion so none of them, no part of protein in membrane. And that becomes important later because we're going to talk about how proteins that are in membranes function and how they help to transport molecules across cell membranes. Okay, so I think with that we're, we're ready to move forward and actually begin to talk about some of the organelles and the systems involved in uh, eukaryotic cells. So we're going to start with something called the endomembrane system. The endomembrane system, endo is in, and we're talking about membrane systems in cells, and it's going to be made up of two separate topics. So one part of the endomembrane system is the endocytic pathway. And the second part is going to be the exocytic pathway. And so both of these are endomembrane systems. And as shown on this slide, the endocytic pathway is the pathway of taking things that are outside the cell to into the cell. From outside the cell here, through membrane-bound compartments, all right, so through membrane-bound compartments, here, here, even this guy, all right, to their ultimate destination. And it's usually, we talk about it being made up of these components, okay? The early endosome, the late endosome, and the lysosome. The plasma membrane, I show it on here because most of the endomembrane system is accessed through the plasma membrane. In the picture you see little green uh, proteins that are transmembrane proteins, integral membrane proteins that bind to a ligand. So you have a receptor binds to a ligand and in this case the ligand is the yellow and through a process of something called receptor mediated endocytosis these yellow dots end up inside of an early endosome and this picture is actually showing you that the green receptors get 
transferred back to the plasma membrane and that process is called recycling. All right, you want to recycle the things that you're going to use over and over and over again. The yellow ligand ends up going from an early endosome to a late endosome and ultimately to the lysosome where it's broken down. There's a couple different ways that things can get to lysosomes and one of them is called a process called phagocytosis. Okay, phagocytosis. And this actually comes from the term phage. And phage means to eat. Yum! Yum, yum, yum. And we have specialized cells in our body that do phagocytosis. So the cells that we have are part of our immune system. In particular, macrophage um, and another one is neutrophils and these guys are good at finding things that maybe your body doesn't want and eating them up and that could either be a microorganism outside or it could be a cell that's undergoing a cell death and what happens is a phago Cytic cell, so these guys, macrophage and neutrophils, are called phagocytic cells. They actually will send membrane out around this guy, shown here. Okay, I'm just really repeating what they're doing. And when this membrane ends up closing, you now have this, this cell, the green thing here, is now in a membrane and it's shown here that that can then go and fuse with a lysosome. I don't really like this picture because it suggests that there is no transport through the pathway and this is sort of old school thinking. This still goes through an early endosome, a late endosome, and ultimately to the lysosome. Not, not without. They have to go through the early and the late endosomes as well. Okay, so that's one specialized mechanism of delivering uh, molecules to the lysosome. Okay. Another mechanism for delivering molecules to the lysosome is something called autophagy. Auto. Auto means you. What did I say, phage? So phage is eat. Eat you, right? Eat yourself, basically. And autophagy is the process that happens inside of a cell where if there's something damaged, let's say you have an organelle and that organelle is a mito they're showing you here a mitochondria, basically drawing a lot of membrane. Let's say this is old mitochondria, a lot of the proteins are damaged, this is a damaged one. It can be engulfed in a membrane and taken into a lysosome and that process is called autophagy. So we believe that this happens to protect ourselves from having too many uh, bad proteins around. So that's a second way that things get to the lysosomes. And finally, that third way was really the first way that we talked about was through this process called receptor-mediated. Receptor-mediated. That's so our receptor is helping us mediate, is to help to get something to the lysosome. It doesn't mean that the receptor goes to the lysosome necessarily. It means that the receptor is helping get something to the lysosome. And once again in this picture, the yellow dots are the ligands, whatever this ligand is. The ligand binds to the receptor, so green is the receptor. And that helps to get it into the cell. The receptors are going to be recycled back out and the cargo itself, which is the yellow, is going to go through the early endosome to a late endosome and ultimately end up in a lysosome. They're never in the cytosol at all. All of these three transport processes through the endocytic pathway, phagocytosis, autophagy, and receptor-mediated endocytosis always has whatever that cargo that's being delivered to the lysosome is in a membrane-bound compartment. That's what you need to know. And I think I mentioned this in class just very briefly. I used to think of them 
the lysosomes as the, you know, garbage dump. Uh, and now I really do believe of it as a recycling center because we know that uh, these molecules that get delivered into the lumen, right, the lumen is the inside of a vesicle. So inside of a vesicle or inside the lysosome. So they're transported inside and they get degraded by proteins. So acid hydrolases are proteins that are enzymes and they help to break down the molecules that are delivered to lysosomes. And so what you see here in these EM images are a lot of proteins that are in lysosomes. Once these molecules are broken down, what are they broken down into? So it breaks, breaks down everything. So it breaks down things into uh, sugars, nucleotides, amino acids, and lipids, and we can recycle those, we can reuse those to our own advantage. If they're really messed up, right, we might even break it down further into atoms and just recycle the atoms. Since uh, matter can't be destroyed, we're never going to get lower than the level of the atom. So just remember, phagocytosis is really cells eating other things, so this is other things, not not itself. In autophagy, cells eating oneself, but really from the inside. And so phagocytosis is maybe the best way I should have put that was, right? Other things, other outside things. Okay. Autophagy is eating things on the inside, and receptor mediated endocytosis is really taking things in from the outside side. I'm going to uh, skip these videos and show you the videos later. Uh, this is also a video, I better remind myself, it's called The Chase, and I will show you that momentarily. I don't think it works here, it does not. And that is the end of the endocytic pathway. So that's pretty much pretty simple. Three compartments, the early endosome, the late endosome, and the lysosome. Endo means in and we're going to take things in or we're going to have things in and delivered to lysosomes to be degraded. That's the big picture. The exocytic pathway is completely different. So instead of breaking things down, now it's going to start building things up. So it's also called the biosynthetic pathway. So it's going to synthesize biological molecules, in particular proteins and lipids. All right, so what do, what do we have so far? I'm going to draw me a cell now. Now you're going to draw me a cell, and you know that, okay, early endosome, late endosome, light endosome, E, E, L, E, L, Y, S. Okay, so you know some of the organelles, early endosome, late endosome, and lysosome are organelles, and they really do move from the outside in. And now what I'm going to do is tell you about a process to get things to go out of the cell. And it's going to start, right, uh, where do you think it's going to start? And it's interesting where this starts, so I'm going to draw for you how I would draw the nucleus at this stage. It's very complicated because it's a lot of membrane and I'm only drawing you a little bit of it. Okay. Right, and so inside here, in this area, that's the nucleus. And what I have in the area here, in the red parts, right, so this part, and this part, and this part, all of this is the endoplasmic. reticulum.
the endoplasmic reticulum, we say, is contiguous. The, the ER, okay, the ER membrane is contiguous with the nucleus, nuclear membrane. They're basically the same. You see that the ER, actually, the ER membrane is holding in the material of the nucleus. And this is really the part where we start talking about the exocytic pathway, so the exocytic pathway, as compared to the endocytic pathway going in. Now there's something that I've left out. I've left out, okay, on the ER, some places on the ER, right? We know that there are ribosomes, and we call that the rough ER. And what do you know about ribosomes? As we discussed in class, ribosomes are all over the cell, and they start in the cytoplasm. And that is where we are really going to start the exocytic pathway. So just be clear here, we're talking about the endomembrane systems, all right, and our system, and it is composed of the endocytic pathway, which we already talked about, and that's in, mostly going to the lysosomes. And now we're going to talk about the exocytic pathway, transport out of the cell. And I said we really need to start by talking about ribosomes. And that's because the exocytic pathway is also called the biosynthetic pathway, pathway, excuse me, synthetic. And that is where we start making proteins. Okay? All right, protein synthesis begins on ribosomes. And if you go back to central dogma, everybody should know central dogma by now. What did we say? We said DNA led to RNA. Okay, it's really mRNA. And that goes to protein. And that means this process here of translation it takes an mRNA molecule and translates it into a protein. Okay? And that means that this mRNA has to be recognized by ribosome. This process always begins in the cytosol. mRNAs are exported out of the nucleus. and they go to the cytoplasm and in the cytoplasm they find a ribosome and translation can begin sometimes they're going to be translating a protein and it's never going to go anywhere other than where it is now in the cytosol but other times that ribosome the whole ribosome goes to the ER and is docked on the ER and that's what you see when we see ribosomes on the ER. Okay. So here's a picture of ribosomes. Now, really important, ribosomes have no membrane, which means they are not an organelle. And then you might say, well, if they're not an organelle, what are they? They're they're made up of RNA and something called RNPs, and that stands for ribonuclear proteins. It's a really dumb name. So RNA and RNPs, and they make sort of uh, these two pieces called, all right, let's just say you have one piece here, and you have another piece here. Looks like a hamburger bun, but what it really is is you have a small subunit and a large subunit and together that makes a ribosome. 
So what you're seeing over here on the right hand side is an EM picture of some ribosomes and these are floating around. Uh, I do believe this was taken outside of a cell but the idea is that these subunits are floating around out in the cytosol. So the ribosomes that start translation, some of them begin translation and then they are dragged from out here all the way in to somewhere on the rough ER. And all of the ones that you see on the ER are translating proteins. Okay? Not all of the ones that are in the cytosol necessarily are translating proteins. There are tons and tons and tons of ribosomes, more ribosomes than you could possibly ever need. Right. So the whole exocytic pathway begins with ribosomes and I think where students get messed up is when we're talking about the exocytic pathway, exocytic, we, we are talking about proteins that really never end up in the cytosol. So we're only really ever talking about the ribosomes that end up going to the ER and the rough ER. Okay? Here this is just to remind you, right, the contiguous with the nuclear envelope, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, right, the innermost portion of the ER is what is surrounding the nucleus. I love this picture. I absolutely love this picture. This is an EM picture and it's showing you the rough ER and all the little black dots on the rough ER are shown. Those are ribosomes. Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of ribosomes docked on the rough ER. But if you look out in the cytosol, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of black dots in the cytosol. And you're only seeing a small portion of the cytosol here. Um, each when we're looking at the membrane here, if I am um, to pinch this and make it bigger, okay, the lumen of the ER is where I'm going to try to draw, right? So in red, uh, inside there, that white space, that is the lumen of the ER. What is the black? The black, all right, so the black lines here, that's the membrane of the ER. And these white dots, those are all ribosomes. That's pretty cool, all right? So the lumen is the inside of the ER. Uh, and I want to show you these things. See these things? What do they look like? They look like little studded balls, right? Those are actually vesicles that are budding off of the ER. They still have ribosomes on them, but things move from the ER to their next destination and proteins or anything that's destined to get out of the cell is packaged into these vesicles so that they never are actually in contact with the cytosol. The cargo is on the inside here or it could be in a membrane, right? It could be a protein that's sticking through the membrane. But these are en route, they're headed towards their next destination along the biosynthetic pathway. So ribosomes, really important. They begin translation, and uh, one of the things that's important, we talk about this sort of in gory, gory detail in um, 380. A protein gets made on a ribosome, and if I'm drawing myself a ribosome, so the ribosome is the machinery that allows this to occur. The mRNA sits in here, and... So you have mRNA, and a protein gets made, and it's coming out the bottom here. Let's just make it white. And so sometimes there's actually a sequence on here that is called a, okay, and this is just part of the sequence. It's, it's a amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, and it's a signal sequence. And the signal sequence is like having a flag that says, hey, Take me, I'm a protein that needs to go to the ER. All right, so the protein itself that's being made directs transport to the ER. All right, 
those proteins get end, end up getting made and they get longer and longer and longer and they're made when they're on the ER and so that's in a really important process called co-translational import co-translational and what does co mean? at the same time so at the same time that translation is occurring it is importing that protein into the lumen of the ER. All right? That's the beginning of the exocytic pathway. Okay, back to central dogma. Okay, just so you're all clear, mRNA, where was that originally made? It was made from DNA by the process of transcription in the nucleus. mRNA gets exported to the cytosol where it meets up with a ribosome and undergoes translation. And some of those proteins are going to end up being made by co-translational import into the ER. Smooth ER, all right, is very, very, very similar to the rough ER. Uh, I'm not so much a fan of this particular pic picture here because it suggests that there's really this huge separation between the rough ER and the smooth ER. We can see in cells differences between the rough and the smooth ER. In this EM image, so this is an EM, right, electron micrograph, you can see on the membranes that there are no little black dots. Right? Let me just do this. Right? If we zoom in here, right, you can actually see that there are some black dots, but right, the black dots they are not on the membranes like we saw before. And this is because this is smooth ER. Smooth ER has a totally different function. It's not for making proteins, but instead it is made, it is designed for two processes. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting this back to the right size. Okay. It has the enzymes required for making lipids, so making phospholipids. And this is where our cells replenish their lipids. And it's also a storage site for calcium, which we'll talk about later. Um, and you'll probably talk about that in multiple classes, especially if you take physiology. So here we have the smooth ER. Uh, lipids, pretty much you need them in all of your membranes. So you need them in your plasma membranes. You need them in right any membrane that you can think of. ER early endosome, late endosome, lysosome. All right. We're going to talk more about the other compartments that have membranes. You're going to see Golgi. Uh, some people put peroxisome, mitochondria. And all of these organelles require lipids. Your cell has to make everything it needs, and one of the things it makes are the lipids, and the lipids are made in the smooth ER. What's made in the rough ER? Proteins in the rough ER. Smooth is lipids. Okay. So let's start again. The exocytic pathway is all about biosynthesis. And when we're talking about biosynthesis, okay, so biosynthesis of proteins and lipids begins, right, proteins begin on the, on the ribosome. Lipids are on the smooth ER, S-E-R. Uh, ribosomes are going to end up on the rough ER. So the exocytic pathway is coming into full. Now after the rough ER, where do things go? So we go start with the rough ER, and the next place we go is something called the ergic. Oh, that's a bad name. 
And let me just tell you, after the ergic, things are going to go to a place called the Golgi. The reason I'm telling you this now is because ergic stands for ER Golgi Intermediate Compartment. What a dumb name. Dum 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 dum. So the ergic is between the rough ER and the Golgi. And it really is an organelle. It has a membrane. Sometimes it's also called the VTC. VTC stands for vesicular tubular cluster. VTC. Here's a nice image showing you the Golgi. The Golgi is really nice, really easy to localize in a cell because I always call it the membrane stack of pancakes. Okay, it is total pancakes. It's like pancake, pancake, pancake. I am making blue pancakes, right? And there's actually six of these pancakes. And each of the pancake is called a cisterna. Okay. That word comes up, you just need to know it. It's the in it's one whole pancake. So this is a pancake. This is a pancake. Three hard for me to figure out where they start and stop. Four, five, six. This one looks a little confused. It looks like it has seven or eight. I think they might be folds that are un un indistinguishable on this. Um, I like this picture though because, let's see if I go, I can't go backwards, but let me erase these. Okay, so if I erase the blue that I just drew. Alright, you can see that you have all of this membrane material, but you also have little vesicles that are budding out of the Golgi. And the way things move through the Golgi is they move from the cis side, cis meaning closest, I hate this color, closest to the ER, and they move from the cis side all the way to the trans side, the other side, and the trans side is sort of on the out, outside side, all right? And they all move through vesicles. So you could get a vesicle budding off here and going to the next one, a vesicle budding off here and going to the next one, a vesicle budding off here and going to the next one. And this is one of the reasons, right, so I was telling you that nothing gets out of these endomembrane systems into the cytosol uh, unless there's really another whole mechanism that we don't know about. And so this is all done through vesicles. There was a big argument a long time ago in the field before you guys were even born and the two arguments were that things only move through vesicles through the ER, right, to Here's the cluster, the VTC, or the ergic, okay, and then they move through vesicles to the cis Golgi, and the middle ones are called medial Golgi's, and then trans Golgi, and then out, usually to the plasma membrane or to another organelle. But somebody made the argument that maybe what's really happening is that once these vesicles bud from the ergic and go to the cis side of the Golgi, this cis side of the Golgi actually matures and over time it becomes the next stack. So it becomes a medial and then you just have more of these guys come and fuse together and this makes a new cis. And this one now is old, not oldest, right? Because the oldest ones are going to be out here. All right, so these are older. And this was called the cisternal maturation hypothesis. Why would you need two hypotheses? Why, why do two different things? Well, it turns out that we could really easily actually see these. You can see the vesicles, and you can actually isolate them. But if we're talking about vesicles, we're talking about small little things, right, holding proteins. And it turns out that there sometimes there are proteins that are too big to fit in a vesicle. And so what's the bottom line of all this? 
we know vesicular transport occurs. We really believe that cisternal maturation occurs in some circumstances, so there's probably some combination of these that occurs inside of cells. All right. Let's review. All right. Let's just open a new existing recording. What exactly is the purpose of the Golgi? And once again, this is a slide, it's an older slide, which I really just need to take it out. So this says that protein sorting and vesicle transport are the main functions of the Golgi. No, 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 no. All right, the main function of the Golgi is to modify, I hate the color, let's do, let's do modify proteins. And when I mean, when I say modify, almost always I am talking about putting, so adding sugars onto proteins. And that process is called glycosylation. Glycosylation. So adding sugars, glycosylation. There are other things that can be added, not just sugars. It can also add phosphates. It can add sulfurs. It can add other molecules. There's something called sumo, sumulation. Lots of protein modifications. And what might you think about modifying proteins? Well, modified proteins have modified function. Right? It's the same as if, you know, take me. If, I, if you take me and you uh, chop off my arm, all right, you've modified my structure. I guarantee you, you're going to modify my function. In this case, we're adding sugars, we're adding phosphates, we're adding sulfurs, we're adding sumo groups, we're adding all sorts of things, or we might be actually adding a bunch of things and then remodeling and, and just changing the function of proteins. Now, here, all right, just notice this is inside the Golgi, right, this whole part up here, inside the lumen of the Golgi, you might have some molecules that are soluble molecules that are being modified by adding tags, in this case the red and the purple tags, and then from the Golgi, sometimes, just sometimes, just sometimes, the tags help to get these things to the right place. So in this case, right, you may not get transport out to the the in this one they're saying to the ER, sometimes these tags say go to the plasma membrane, these tags say take me to a lysosome. So think of the tags as modifications that help get things to the right place at the right time. Uh, here's another example. On a battlefield, right, the medics always wore a big white uh, red cross so that the enemy wouldn't shoot them. It was actually considered poor form for the enemy to shoot your Red Cross because your Red Cross guys were trying to help the wounded. Um, nowadays, I'm pretty sure it's fair game and they're probably, people don't wear their Red Cross anymore because it, it's just something to shoot at. Very sad. Alright, so we're talking about the exocytic, so I'm going to start on the bottom, right, so exocytic pathway. And if it starts on the ER, alright, and here's my ER, all right, and I have some ribosomes on here. Okay, what's this area called? This is going to be the nucleus. All right, and so what happens is you get vesicles bud out of the rough ER, and they go to a place called, the in-between place, called... All right, so you might have some clusters of membranes here, and the vesicle fuses here and dumps the content, and this is the VTC or the ergic. Okay, now once that happens, then you get a vesicle to bud off here. All right, so a vesicle buds. Sorry, a vesicle buds from the VTC or ergic, and that vesicle moves forward to the cis face of the Golgi. This is my pancake stack again. Okay, you don't have to draw all of them. Three is fine if you want to draw them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so this vesicle now fuses with the cis face of the Golgi, cis Golgi. And 
once it fuses, right, so it's going to dump its content, and then the content gets put into another one that buds and fuses, buds and fuses, buds and fuses, buds and fuses, until it reaches the trans Golgi. And then from here, it buds and goes to its final destination. So we have the exocytic pathway, it's made up of the rough ER to the ergic to the Golgi. All right. Now let's go back a slide. Okay, so we're good here. We have the exocytic pathway starting with the rough ER to the VTC or the ergic, from the ergic to the Golgi, and from the Golgi it goes to its final destination. That final destination is anywhere in the cell or it could be out of the cell, transported outside the cell in a process of exocytosis outside the cell. All right, all of the transport that we just talked about is through vesicles. And the idea of vesicular transport, which you'll t we'll just talk about unendingly in 380, has three steps. You have to have something bud, right? So here they're showing you the green protein is made. It now is packaged into a membrane vesicle. The vesicle, they didn't show you out here, but the vesicle is transported and let me get green, let me just make that, so that should be green in here, right, so that green molecule is being transported, the vesicle buds, transports, sorry, I should do this with colors, so this is the bud, this is the transport, here it's being transported, and the final step is in the fusion of the vesicle with the next membrane. All of the endocytic pathway, so the endocytic and the exocytic pathways are regulated by vesicular transport vesicles. Okay? So really, the endomembrane system is the system of all of these membrane compartments that use vesicles to transport a molecule from one place to another. So on the endocytic pathway we're talking about early endosomes to a late endosome to a lysosome. These are all things you should know. And on the exocytic pathway it's from the rough ER to the ergic to the Golgi and right out to its final destination and that final destination basically can be another organelle All right, this final destination is another organelle or outside the cell that is going to do it people uh, it's an hour I'm hoping you will come in to class on Monday full well knowing all of this because we have to, we're still going to be behind. Um, I will get a quiz posted for you though for this and then we'll keep going on Monday. Have a nice weekend.